Welcome to my video recapping my ride down the Great Divide mountain bike route. This stretches from Banff all the way down to Mexico and after doing the Colorado and the Arizona trail over the last few years this was the big one left. I didn't have time to do it in one year so this is part one from Banff down to the bottom of Wyoming and hopefully I will complete part two over Colorado and New Mexico in the next year. Like all these trails, there's a lot of up and downhill, a total of around 200,000 feet for the whole Tour Divide trail. Similar to last year, I raised money again for the Zambian carnivore program, a very well-deserved uh, conservation entity based in Zambia. In a change from my previous bike trips, I had to pack up the bike in a box, fly to Canada, then unbox the bike and get all the provisions together before taking an Uber to Banff, since there was no bus running, and starting off on the Great Divide Trail. Trails on this route vary quite a bit. There's actually some very nice single track, but overall it's a small percentage of the route compared to the Colorado or the Arizona trails. When you do get it, it's a lot of fun to ride. There's even this amazing suspension bridge up in uh, Canada. Most of the route though, you're on fire roads, quite often in remote areas, or sometimes farming or secondary roads. There's actually quite a bit of pavement as well in certain sections. But for the most part, you're on dirt roads as you make your way across these western states. Sometimes these deteriorate into four-wheel drive tracks of varying quality. Some definitely you end up having to push your bike up and they are completely unrideable. But that's the nature of the game. And then I did do a little bit of riding at night. I try to avoid it because you're here to see the scenery and it's only when you really have to get somewhere, in this case to pick up a mail package in Butte, that I did ride into the night or having it as a backup and a safety mechanism. As expected, the scenery along the route did not disappoint. From the towering mountains, especially up in Canada, the northern part of Montana, and of course when you get down to the Grand Teton National Park area, you just riding through this beautiful wilderness area. Some areas very, very remote, some a little bit closer. There's lots of tourists around Grand Teton, for instance. And eventually, you know, relenting into the southern drier areas that have their own rugged beauty, lack of water for the most part, and you know, parts of America that not many people get to see. So very nice to be out there biking all on your own. Of course, there's ample farm scenery, ranch land along the way as well. Again, iconic and unique to this region that plays such an important role in farming overall and where the quintessential ranches are all coming from. I loved seeing wildlife along the way, including these pronghorn that are actually not antelope and its closest relatives are giraffes and okapis. Unfortunately, I only had a iPhone so I couldn't get clearer pictures. Dull sheep making their way up the ridge. Seeing these dull sheep were awesome though. And uh, similar to the collars that we sponsor with Zambia Carnivore Program, these were collared to track their movements as well. On the birding side, the Red Rock Lakes National Wildlife Refuge was one of the more, more interesting areas. And it's a hugely important uh, sanctuary for birds in North America. By far my favorite wildlife along the route were these wild horses deep into the basin in Wyoming. Middle of nowhere, doesn't seem like there's much to eat for them, yet there's quite a substantial number and they were in really, really good condition as well. I will forever remember this site.
I ended up camping every night along the route. It's my preferred way of overnighting. Except for one night when I stayed in this little mountain shelter right at the top of Coco Pass where I arrived utterly exhausted. But so many beautiful campsites in various areas. Nice thing with a bike is you can kind of slip off the road just about anywhere and find yourself this really wild spot where there's no one else around and you have all that you know wildness and wilderness for yourself. There aren't really too many dangerous animals out there. Yes, I saw one bear, but they don't tend to, to bother you too much. I even camped by a cemetery one night. But come rain or shine, I so prefer to be out in the middle of nowhere under a starry sky rather than staying in some hotel somewhere. One of the unique things though is that sometimes people let you stay in their backyard or front yard uh, along the trail. I met this wonderful couple, Tom and Pam, and they literally invite cyclists to come and camp in their yard, play with the dog. Just a, a model of hospitality and very interesting as a way to meet people as well. Another feature of this route is that you pass through a number of towns from well-known adventure centers like Fernie or Whitefish in Montana to the state capital, Helena, and larger towns like Butte, Montana. These are good stops to kind of reprovision and pick up food for the next leg and, uh, you know, for some people to stay in a hotel along the way as well. Several small towns along the way are also exceptionally welcoming of cyclists. I've even built a little bit of an economy around that. Ovando is a very good example with uh, multiple accommodation options, including some quirky ones. The famous Llama Farm have these little cabins where they welcome cyclists to stay for free. And it's sort of a bit of a respite from camping. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to stay, but I enjoyed the company of the llamas for a little bit, as well as Barbara's hospitality. Pinedale is another. It's also the gateway to the Wind River Range and definitely a town I want to return to. Living in Boulder, it was also kind of fun to come by Boulder, Wyoming, a little bit smaller than the one that I live in and a little bit more in a remote area. But another classic spot is Atlantic City, where the mercantile is the only sort of business in town for provisioning and meals. And it's really, really eclectic and very welcoming to cyclists. Other towns are just a little bit scruffier. And it must be a Montana thing, but so many convenience stores are decorated with all kinds of taxidermy along with the normal convenience store provisions. Quite often also fly fishing gear. And in this one in Lima, Montana, you can buy children's toys and a semi-automatic rifle or a handgun in the gas station convenience store. The other fascination seems to be with wood carving, and I came across some excellent examples along the route. Also no shortage of signs on how the world should be, or how they think you should live your life. There are also two very interesting historical towns along this part of the trail. The first is Bannock, Montana, the original capital and the site where the first gold was found in Montana. Very well preserved and worth a stop along the way. The second is South Pass, Wyoming. Equally interesting and very, very well restored. Of course, you always meet interesting people along the way. Whether fellow cyclists from around the world, some going southbound, some going northbound, some just doing the Divide Trail, some having bigger dreams and even planning to go all the way through South America, for instance, or people in the towns and along the way, it makes the cycling very rewarding. I often get asked about the dangers of cycling alone in remote areas. 
And inevitably the conversation turns towards bears. Yes, they're out there and there is a number of them, but it's quite manageable, especially if you look after, you know, keeping your food away from them, carry some bear spray in case there is an encounter. But it is not nearly the biggest challenge out there. Weather and big thunderstorms, you know, cold, heat, lightning, uh, wind, that's much, much more of a challenge. And one of the unique uh, ones in this part of the world is this peanut butter mud that can completely mess up your bike and is almost impossible to ride through. And then there's always something unique that comes up, like I was held up by a train that blocked the passage on the road for close to half an hour. But when I come back, this is what I want to do in Montana on my next trip. And for now, this is it. I safely made it. Brooke picked me up and uh, we're back home in Boulder. Tune in next year for part two across Colorado and Nevada. And thank you for watching.